Hello, and welcome to Phoenix Cinema Leicester. Uh, my name is Becky Jones, and on behalf of Phoenix, uh, we're really proud and very excited to have here with us Martin Polly, director of the International Center for Sports History and Culture, here to give us a nice little introduction talk to Borg versus McEnroe. Thanks very much. That's the easiest round of applause I've ever had. I was just saying, it's just like being in a lecture. You all sit as far back as possible, but in a cinema, I guess that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Um, first off, thanks very much uh, to Becky and the staff of the Phoenix for inviting me. Um, I've done one talk in the cinema before, and it's great to, to get out of the classroom and into, into different kinds of public spaces. And um, what they've asked me to do is really just give a little bit of a background chat, a bit of contextual chat, to set this film up. First off, I have to explain, I haven't seen the film yet, so anything I say about what might be in there is subject to what goes on. I hope they haven't messed with history too much, but with the movies, you never know. Um, the other point is that I won't give away any plot spoilers in case anyone doesn't know the real outcome of the match that this is all about. And if they get it wrong, we can talk about it afterwards. So um, I'm proud to represent De Montfort University and the International Centre for Sports History and Culture, uh, which celebrates its 21st birthday this year. And it's great to welcome people, some connected to the centre, some of our students, and some people we don't know already, to this screening. What I want to do is, first off, just chat a little bit about sport in the movies. Um, there is a very long tradition of filmmakers looking to sport for their subject matter. And I could very happily run an entire module about the ways in which film represents sport. I think sport has got a number of very obvious appeals to filmmakers. It's the kind of thing that can lend itself very well to romance. I'm kind of hoping that Borg versus McEnroe is a better tennis movie than Wimbledon, but I don't think it'll be quite as romantic. It's the kind of, sport is the kind of subject that can lend itself brilliantly, of course, to action movies. Uh, Orwell famously called Sport War Minus the Shooting, and I think many sport movies have been war, war movies minus the shooting particularly uh, boxing movies like Rocky and its uh, later franchise. Sport lends itself very well to straightforward narratives of the race, the match, the season, that fit so easily into the storytelling arc of a feature-length movie. Sport provides characters, and sports movies, at their best, can get into the real nature of sport, looking at ways in which characters uh, have explored sport and expressed themselves through sport as meditations on the human condi condition. And I would put Rage Scorsese's Raging Bull very high on my top of list for sports movies in this capacity, and possibly The Hustler as well. Some sports movies explore tensions around class, gender, ethnicity, and other relationships that can then be played out through the vehicle of sport. Uh, this Sporting Life is, again, probably my favourite from the, the 1960s kitchen sink, sink genre, if you like, with Richard Harris starring as a rugby league player with all kinds of stories about gender relations and class tensions going on uh, around that story. This can also work in, in more comic ways with, of course, Spend It Like Beckham as being an excellent example of ways in which uh, identity around ethnicity, gender, tradition, family versus peer group can all be played out with sport as the vehicle. Some filmmakers, like tonight's, have been attracted to true stories in sport, of which Chariots of Fire is probably uh, the most famous British example. And again, Borg versus McEnroe fits into that genre, where s true stories of real athletes, real tennis players, real performers, have given uh, the, the raw material for filmmakers to make their narrative. One of my favourite areas, I must admit, and one that I think a lot of work could be done on, is ways in which some filmmakers have used sport as a way of imagining how dystopian societies might find their entertainment. And I think Rollerball certainly fits into this, this category. Death Race 2000 and, more recently, The Hunger Games have been very much part of this tradition of how games, entertainment, sportive activities in dystopian societies could tell us about how those societies might work. And, of course, outside my remit today, really, think about all the great sport documentaries that have been made, um, uh, Olympia, Senna, Hoop Dreams, and so on. Leaving documentaries out of it, of course, there are some huge risks that any director and screenwriter who wants to make a sport-themed movie has to deal with. 
because it's worth stressing that not all sport movies have met with critical acclaim. Escape to victory, I'm looking at you. <laughs> These risks, of, of course, include actors not being athletes. I had a very interesting chat with uh, Tom McNabb, athletics coach, who was the consultant to Chariots of Fire, who said that working with the actor Ben Cross, who played Harold Abrahams, was deeply problematic because Ben Cross had two speeds of running whenever the camera was rolling, fast and bloody fast. And this meant they had to put in huge breaks between each take so he could recover to do it all again. Um, if you look at a movie like Escape to Victory and keep an eye on the, the ways in which the cut between Sylvester Stallone or, or Michael Caine playing a footballer, you'll see the headshot and then the action, you just see the disembodied feet because, of course, they're not actually playing to keep up with Aussie ideas and Pele. Another risk, of course, is that far too many sports movies rely on cliches. The underdog turning it, turning it around to win the match, the trophy, the season. The coach as the absent father is just there in so many sports movies. Or just the homespun, simple moral of hard work paying off and winning you the medal and the girl. Sports movies are full of cliches like this. I think a third risk is it's obviously very difficult, and this is one I'm really looking forward to tonight, difficult to recreate sporting action in a convincing way, especially when the film is recreating real events. All of you after this could go back and watch the real footage of Borg McEnroe. And be, I'm looking forward to that to see how the two correlate. Just a quick reminder, I know I will have missed many people's favourite examples of how sport and celluloid have a long and intriguing relationship. There's a long history behind movies like Borg versus McEnroe. What I want to do now is to tell you a little bit about the, um, the rivalry in context. And I think this picture is fantastic. So you're, OK, they haven't got the McEnroe perfect, but I think the Borg is an absolute dead ringer. And I'm looking forward to seeing how that plays. Apart from the height, but you can't have everything. I just want to give a quick reminder of the rivalry. And I'm, I am aware that I'm showing my age a little bit. I was 15 years old when this final happened. I'm aware that there are people here who haven't heard of Borg and McEnroe before tonight. So it's worth quickly stressing it. As they came into the 1980 Wimbledon Championships, Borg was 24 years old, and he came to Wimbledon in 1980 with a fantastic record. He'd won the French Open five times already, he'd won the US Open twice, and he'd won Wimbledon four times in succession, 1976, 77, 78, 79. So 1980, he was going for the fifth in succession, a phenomenal record. McEnroe was only three years his junior, 21 years old at the time, he had no Grand Slams under his belt, although he had won the Wimbledon men's doubles in 1979. And 1980 was his first Wimbledon singles final. Before they met in the match that forms the, 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 the linchpin of tonight's movie, they had played each other seven times. And again, that's always an interesting thing to look out for. Do we get a sense of their history? Uh, they would played on various surfaces at various events from Stockholm onwards, but they'd never played on grass before this match, and had never played each other at a Grand Slam before this match. And the record stood at Borg four victories, McEnroe three, before the Wimbledon final. They then met in the dramatic final, no plot spoilers for any of those of you who don't know, uh, and that forms the focus of the film. But behind the rivalry, I think there's a lot more going on here, because Wimbledon was obviously at something of a, a, a turning point in its history here. Professionalism had fully bedded in. Tennis, sorry, Wimbledon had gone open, but only 12 years earlier. It really is worth remembering that. It, it, it's late as 1968, Wimbledon was still an amateur-only tournament. Wimbledon was going through something of a modernisation process, but one that the All England Club ran carefully so as to avoid blatant commercialisation. The late 70s, early 80s was a period in which many sports, in Britain in particular, were going down the line of very overt, explicit commercialisation. Liverpool a Football Club are famously credited as being the first elite club to have shirt sponsorship. Some amateur ones had done it beforehand, but with their Hitachi uh, kit in 1978, was seen as very much the, the shape of things to come. And places like Wimbledon were under some great pressure from commercial backers, interested commercial backers, to go down this line. They were finding themselves inundated with offers for renting out centre court for boxing matches or for rock concerts, for having tournament sponsorship, for having um, adverts at the perimeter of the court. 
And they could have earned, they still could earn millions from going down these lines. But the All England Club saw itself then as now as very much a bastion of English traditional values, and they resisted this. So we're in this very interesting moment. Instead of outright commercialism, they went down the line of suppliers. And I know my students will know exactly what's coming at this point. Slazinger had been providing balls at Wimbledon since 1902. Just keep an eye on the dates here for a sense of how slow Wimbledon was to adapt. In 1938, their second partner joined them, Robinson's Barley Water. Forty years later, 1978, Rolex joined them as their official timekeeper. So just two years before Borg McEnroe, we see this coming. And things speed up a bit, a bit after this. Just 12 years later, 1990, IBM becomes their official IT partner. They now have 13 partners. Very different commercial model from sponsorship. But I do think that the late 70s, early 80s was a bit of a, 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 a seminal moment as Wimbledon was coming to terms with the need to modernise versus the desire to stay pure and to keep that traditional image in place. And into this mix came John McEnroe and Bjorn Borg. Borg, at this time, as I've said, was the four-time champion. I am showing my age here, but he had a huge fan base in Britain for his style, his speed, his strength, both physical and mental, his fitness, his stamina, and his obviously impressive record. I won't say he was exactly exotic, but I do think we can link him with the other two great <laughs> Swedish imports of the period, ABBA and Volvo, as being something new, as being something incredibly cool to hit Britain at the time. He was also known for his exemplary conduct on court, and he was absolutely loved in Britain, certainly launched a great number of hairstyles. He was, and this is a really interesting point, I think, he was the first Swede ever to win the overseas category of the Sports Personality of the Year Award on the BBC in 1979. And he was only the third tennis player to do that. Um, Rod Laver and Arthur Ashe had been the previous. And if we look at the, the list of people who won that up to that time to put, get a real idea of how loved Borg was in this country, we're looking at people like Garfield Sobers, um, Abibi Bikila, Pele, Olga Corbett, Nadia Komanech, Nikki Lauda, and of course, Muhammad Ali, posing here with Borg uh, the night Borg won. This guy was an absolute hero. And he's up against the new kid on the block, John McEnroe. Brash, hair out of control. They both wore bandanas, but Borg made his work an awful lot better. And with an absolutely terrible reputation for his on-court behaviour, arguing with officials. This came to a bit of a head, really, in 1980 in the semi-final against Jimmy Connors. They launched the whole you-cannot-be-serious arguments with the umpires and the line judges. And he was presented in the British press uh, in very, very hostile terms. Nicknames such as Super Brat, The Incredible Sulk, and McTantrum followed him wherever he went. Wimbledon, with its brand of being gentle and genteel, its English garden party brand, really did not like this kind of behaviour. And the rest of Britain, I think, kind of followed this. The two images I've got are a little bit later, so I'm being a little bit naughty here. These both come from 1982. But again, I think they show his reputation in Britain. One was uh, a, a single that was released in 1982 by it was a, a comedian calling himself the brat for this with a song Chalk Dust, which actually well, sampled bits of Wimbledon commentary over it's a dreadful record, please don't, don't go out and search this out on iTunes. But the whole thing was how appalling McEnroe was behaving. And then very famously in the comedy sketch show on the BBC, Not the Nine O'Clock News, they had a skit involving imagining McEnroe at breakfast with his parents, where he's asking them to pass the juice. They don't hear him, so he's screaming, you cannot be serious, everyone can see the juice is there, and so on. And this is very much how he was um, mediated in Britain. And what I'd like to leave you with, I guess, is just to think about how these two um, characters, the more old-fashioned, obviously, as we'll see, he was just as scientific in his preparation, but the more old-fashioned, the more gentlemanly Borg against the super brat, the incredible sulk of McEnroe, coming along, along at a time when Wimbledon is exploring ways in which it can modernise. Now, it's not my role to tell you the outcome of the match. Some of you will know, the rest of you will find out soon. Um, I hope that you will enjoy the movie and that it can take us into a fascinating moment in the history of tennis and the history of sport. 
a moment when an old-fashioned tournament was dealing with modernisation, a moment that was helped on by this truly epic conflict, it was a great final, between these huge but very different characters. And along the way, while you're watching, I'd ask you to reflect on the ways in which sport lends itself to the feature film treatment, how the history of sport is always ripe for exploration by filmmakers, filmmakers interested in character, drama, action, tension, good guys and bad guys, the narratives of victory and defeat. Or, I can't do this without quoting the words of Rudyard Kipling, famously used throughout Wimbledon in If, victory and defeat or triumph and disaster. Let's watch the film and see who triumphs and who faces disaster. Thank you. <laughs>